Hi, everybody. All right, I'll just give uh, a quick um, info about my background and then move on to the presentation. Um, so I'm actually um, an assistant professor and chair of uh, Kadir House University in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, I'm based in Istanbul. I'm, I'm a Turkish citizen. Um, I did my uh, undergraduate studies in Middle, Middle East Technical University in, in Turkey, and then um, I went to the United States uh, to Georgia Tech to do my master's in digital design and fabrication, uh, where I met Lars Spybrook, who actually works on at the intersection of uh, digital technologies and theory. And then I decided to uh, do my PhD at Georgia Tech on design computation, where I actually developed um, an algorithmic study of Goethean morphology. I'll be showing you uh, some examples of that today, along with other research uh, that I do uh, that I frame under digital romanticism. Um, but I'm basically interested in the intersection of technology with history and how we can actually use algorithms to study architecture. So uh, we're going to look at a lot of examples today and I'll give you some more information about my background as well. Um, so, I mean, when we think about parametric design nowadays, we actually don't um, look at examples like this, and I get fascinated with historical works of architecture. This is um, the portal of the Divri Mosque found in uh, Malatya, Turkey. And um, as you can see, it's full of details, uh, full of ornamentation. And I think um, th this, is this is also a world heritage site, basically. It's, in, um, it's, a, it's under UNESCO. Um, and I get fascinated when I look at historical works like this because I think uh, architecture had had a really different aesthetic outlook for ornamentation, for geometry um, during the medieval ages. And I think right now, with the advent of technology, we might start questioning how we actually use these systems aesthetically in the way we do research and we uh, design buildings as well. And I'll be showing you some examples that kind of spun out of this, but that will be kind of my overall agenda, like kind of a um, historic a technological perspective to historical works as well. And that's kind of where my uh, research is situated. I am um, I actually come from a design background. I studied architecture, but then I did my master's in digital design and fabrication. So where I got introduced to computational technologies. And then during my PhD, I actually did uh, my minor in computer graphics and took a lot of computer programming cl classes and then started developing algorithms and scripts uh, that can be utilized for architectural research as well. And um, I'll share with you some examples of that. And my PhD dissertation is actually what I call as digital romanticism. It's basically a rereading of Goethe's writings developed in the 18th century on morphology. And Goethe uh, was actually a really pro prominent figure during romanticism. Uh, he's um, primarily a poet, so he's called a literary genius, but he wrote extensively on natural sciences as well. He developed a lot of ideas about um, uh, plants and animals. He wrote some rudimentary texts on architecture. And he, all, he was also interested in philosophy and he also wrote a full treatise on color. Uh, so that makes him a really interesting figure. Uh, I think that is somehow not fully understood. And in my dissertation, in my uh, research, I actually looked at his body of work and developed some algorithmic uh, explorations on his, some of his ideas. And um, Goethe actually coined the term morphology. Morphology is a precursor to biology, uh, the modern uh, on how we understand uh, biological forms today is actually um, was pretty much understood at the intersection of chemistry, physics, and biology um, during 18th century. And Goethe defines uh, morphology um, as, um, as kind of a bridge between different sciences. So he says morphology rests on the conviction that everything that exists must ex express and indicate itself the inorganic, the vegetative, the animal, the human, each expresses itself, each appears as that which it is to our outer sense and to our inner sense. Form is a moving, a becoming, a passing thing. The doctrine of forms is the doctrine of transformation. The doctrine of metamorphosis is the key to all signs of nature. So um, for Goethe, all organic forms uh, actually operate under the concept of metamorphosis. So that's basically a dynamic principle that he articulates primarily in his study of plant morphology, where he describes metamorphosis alternating cycles of expansion and contraction. 
Um, now, if you read Metamorphosis of Plants, which is written in 1795, uh, it's basically a PhD dissertation. I would think about it as um, just like 123 paragraphs. It's a really short essay, uh, but it's full of details on how a plant grows. And for Goethe, he comes up with these two terms that he calls as expansion and contraction. Expansion basically seems like an outward growth, whereas contraction is a, is a negative growth, almost like a pulling inward movement. And uh, Goethe actually looks at the plant organs. These are annual flowering plants. And he finds that these actually alternate through the growing stages. And he defines different organs that are produced along the stem uh, somehow related to these forces. So it's, it's almost like a breathing cycle, right? Like nature is pulsating fluids, pulling and pushing fluids. And this is kind of it, having a reciprocated effect on the, on the forms that are generated. So uh, in Metamorphosis of Plants, he says, from the seed, the fullest development of stem leaves we noted first as expansion. Thereupon we saw the calyx developing through contraction, the petals through expansion and the sexual organs again through contraction. And soon we shall become aware of the maximum expansion in the fruit and the maximum concentration in the seed. In these six steps, nature ceaselessly carries on her eternal work of reproducing the plants by means of two sexes. So for Goethe, expansion and contraction is actually the sexual polarized forces of nature. So that's like how we get also almost like a gendered basis of, um, of natural production, right? So that's why I think this kind of chiastic model, like chiastic being the dichotomous, like dual model, is kind of a, uh, an engine, a machine that can output forms. Now, this is, um, of course, very interesting because um, morphology is a dynamic principle of, uh, um, of form. It's a theory. It's based on polarity. And it combines two principles, performation and epigenesis. And it's it's kind of tackles the fixed notion of typology as well. Typology, the way we understand it in biology, is basically a prescribed type, right? All the, for instance, maple leaves or all the um, dog species or like the, the way we call a specific form the way we attribute a name to it, it has a specific appearance, right? But of course, of course, we cannot fixate it to a single form because there are topological variations as well as a lot of traits. So in that sense, typology uh, becomes restrictive, but it, that's where it, is, it has shortcomings, shortcomings because it excludes all this dynamic variation that might happen. So morphology tries to actually expand on that. And when I think about uh, the notion of metamorphosis, particularly uh, expansion and contraction, uh, if we think about polarity, polarity is basically like a magnet, right? So if we understand natural organic forms through polar notions, then we are, um, I started speculating on this during my PhD, but basically we are actually looking at um, a notion of polar axis, right? So there are expansive tips and contractive tips along an axial distribution. So this, this axis also happens in anatomy. It happens in plants. It happens in earth as well. So like celestial bodies as well. So it works with um, these sorts of magnetic principles. And I, I kind of arrived at this kind of formulation. But of course, visualizing it through a simple diagram like this is not sufficient if, if we are investigating uh, formal appearances. So that's where I started looking at plants a bit more. So when we look at leaves, for instance, um, here I'm comparing the morphologies of two different leaves. Here you're looking on the left to Boston fern and on the right to Japanese aralia. And if you look carefully at the, um, at the diminishing lengths of these leaflets, on the left you will see kind of a radial um, or, or um, a dynamic motion towards the tip because that's how that leaf grows. Uh, by the way, these are uh, ferns are compound leaves. So the the because we have individual single leaflets doesn't actually take away the fact that this is actually a single leaf that is growing. It's a highly segmented single leaf still because it's a compound leaf. And uh, this this polarized distribution of leaflets that is showing us kind of a movement towards the tip is actually happening in the reverse in our alia. So that already sets some sort of a polar basis of morphology. Here you can see that one, uh, the ferns are kind of deviated towards the tip, which I call as expansive types, whereas Japanese aralia are more contractive types because they show more radial symmetry and they have diminishing lengths in the reverse fashion. Now, if you think about expansion and contraction as algorithmic rules, um, you can start speculating on how to actually uh, explore geometry through these principles, right? So expansion 
as I described, is an upward motion. So we are basically expanding a line into space by adding more points to it, right? So two points define a third point and it becomes a triangle. Whereas in contraction, this motion is reversed. So we are not growing outward, but we are pulling inward to a, a center. And uh, by alternating these, uh, these two principles, you can also define different types of parametric form generation tools. And that's where I actually started investigating leaves. And here the concept of metamorphosis becomes interesting because we actually start noticing some sort of fractalized behavior. Um, just like Goethe described the concept of metamorphosis, expansion and contraction are alternating like breeding cycles. So they are reciprocated. So expansion is um, followed by contraction and that's followed by expansion, right? So we are moving out, moving in, moving out, moving in. And this kind of uh, recursive algorithm actually can be used to define uh, a lot of complex leaf forms. And by changing these parameters, you can actually achieve a lot of variation as well. So in a sense, Goethe's notion works when we think about leaves, because we can actually simulate this using code. Now, of course, during 18th century, coding doesn't exist. So by using computation, I'm investigating Goethe's ideas. So that says a lot, about, a, lot, a lot of things about the way Goethe thinks about nature as well, right? So these are rule-based organic forms. Then how do we actually compute them? How can we actually visualize Goethe's theory? So that's kind of my take on the thesis. Um, like basically what I call as digital romanticism. So if we can build tools, technological tools, maybe we can investigate these ideas a bit more. We can, we can speculate on the generative capacities of these types. And um, this is, um, this, these are kind of the examples of the leaves I generated for a publication in Leonardo a few years ago. And you can see that there are a lot of diversity in leaves, but uh, all of these are basically operating on different types of parameters, right? So here um, we are defining as uh, different type, types of leaves, but of course they are variable as well. And on the next slide, you will see the expansive and contractive cycles of them, which are basically this, site, uh, this type of uh, recursive fractalized um, developmental trajectories. And when we actually compute these leaves in this fashion, now we can actually classify them as, as expansive and contractive types as well. So we get kind of a polarized description of morphology. And uh, I would say the, the easiest classification is if, if a leaf has radial symmetry, like in this case, you can look at, let's, let's say, Luxpur or maple or ginkgo types. There, if there's radial distribution of leaflets, then that's a contractive type. But if the movement is deviated towards the tip of the leaf, then it's an expansive type. And by alternating between these parameters, you can get a lot of expressive variation. And um, of course, Goethe not only talked about plants, he also talks, talks a lot about anim animals. And he says that the biggest dichotomy in nature between animals and plants is actually a polarized dichotomy. So plants are geared towards expansion. They're more geared towards light. They grow in light. And they're more about fixity and rigidity. They're more about structure. Whereas animals are more about, uh, animals grow in the dark. So they are more contractive and animals express more mobility and freedom, right? So there's kind of a polarized notion of uh, animals and plants in Goethean morphology as well. And he says, plants and animals in their least perfect state are scarcely to be differentiated. The creatures which gradually emerge from this barely differentiated relationship of plant and animal pursue diametrically opposite paths in their development towards perfection. Thus, plants attain their final glory in the tree, enduring and rigid, while the animals does so in man by achieving the highest degree of mobility and freedom. So in a sense, Goethe's outlook on nature is also has some polar basis, right? Animals um, being uh, contractive organisms, plants being expansive organisms. So one operates in light, the other one in dark. So this kind of chiastic model actually per pervades all of Go Goethean thought. And when we look at animals a bit more, in detail, Goethe describes that there's a, there's actually a tri tripartite system in animals. So the, the animal anatomy actually is, um, is made out of three segments. So in insects, which are basically contracted animals, we actually share a lot of uh, genes with insects called homeobox genes. And the head, thorax, and abdomen, those are the three segments that are responsible for the um, sensitive, locomotive, and reproductive parts. And in animals, the thorax and the abdomen are converged because the hind legs actually appear at the end of the third system, but still we get kind of an axial structure in animals as well. So this type of polar axis 
uh, replicates itself in the animal anatomy, which is, I think, an interesting Goethean idea. And furthermore, if you look at more in detail to the, to the way the bonds are structured, uh, then we get a polarized distribution of parts, basically what I call as the torso limb index. So the torso uh, is basically um, a continuous segmented part um, where, uh, from which limbs actually protrude, right? So um, the torso can also self-segment, producing the head and the abdomen, the reproductive parts, but the limbs are more about motion and movement because that's how the animals engage with the environment. And uh, limbs actually have more discontinuous variation. They're more, there's more asymmetry in limb formation, whereas torsos have more continuous segmentation because of the vertebrae distribution. So in a sense, this type of polar thinking about the anatomy could be applied to, to the way the parts are organized as well. And I'm, I'm going to explain why I'm talking about this because some of these ideas are actually mimicked in architecture and we can speculate why it is being copied in certain historical works. Uh, because um, I think it's somehow related to the notion of symmetry. Now, of course, symmetry is, um, is kind of an interesting idea, interesting topic and a problematic one in architecture, especially in 20th century with the advent of modernism, it's being avoided because we are, I think, more interested in asymmetry than symmetry. And uh, symmetry is uh, kind of an idea that, um, um, that kind of revitalized itself during the Renaissance especially when artists, artists and artisans started reading uh, Vitruvius, who wrote the first treatise, The Architectural and Architecture, where he described this uh, Vitruvian man. Vitruvian man is all about um, the aesthetics of proportion and symmetry, right? So uh, basically these perfect forms of deity, the circle and the square, it was described in the Vitruvian text as being overlapping in the human anatomy. And the human anatomy, according to Vitruvius, is perfect. So that's why it needs to accommodate these perfect natural uh, forms or perfect forms of God, right? Uh, but of course, I think Leonardo disproved it by the Vitruvian, his Vitruvian man drawing, because here you can see that the, the centers of the circle and the square are actually transposed because the body is not symmetrical, it's in fact asymmetrical. So you can see that the, the center of the um, circle is actually at the navel, but the center of the square is moved towards the genitalia. So there's kind of an asymmetry embedded in the body. So I think this is not a diagram of symmetry, it's a diagram of asymmetry, which makes it a lot more interesting for us because I think symmetrical bodies doesn't mean there cannot be asymmetries distributed or redistributed. Because it, if you look at, for instance, the arms and legs, which are, homo, um, which are homologues, right? Arms are leg-like, legs are arm-like. And in that sense, we see a lot of different variation in the animal kingdom. Like our hind legs are longer than our forelegs, like four, forearms, for instance, right? So in that sense, there's some asymmetry between the parts as well. Now, why is this interesting? Is because um, architects during the Renaissance, they tried to interpret symmetry and try to juxtapose it on architectural works. So the way we were describing uh, the organization of architectural bodies that was mimicking animal properties. So here you can see that the, the apse, the transepts, the nave, uh, the parts of the building, they were prescribed from human anatomy. So in this case, we, have, we are looking at this kind of T figure, standing T figure. But of course, there are a lot of problems with this Renaissance interpretation because it's restricted to human anatomy only, but the animal kingdom can express a lot more variation, right? If you try to place a different type of animal on this plan, then you will get different proportions. If you have like, let's say, um, an eagle with like giant wings, but a really contracted torso, then of course you will get uh, a different body plan. So in a sense, this prescriptive notion, this typological notion of architecture was limited, restrictive. And I think it didn't understand symmetry properly. Now with computational tools, we can actually tackle that a lot more. And that's, I think, where uh, variation comes in really interesting because um, like just like animal bodies, architecture can have a lot of diversity, right? So we can have extensive antennas, we can have multiple legs, we can have hard shells, uh, bloated bodies, thin bodies, wings as well, right? All these properties that we see in the animal kingdom, how do they actually replicate themselves in architecture? How do we see the sea of variation in architecture uh, in this fashion? So that's kind of where my research comes in. So I'm trying to develop um, this kind of techno-historic outlook on form, but also trying to expand on how we study variation in architectural form generation. 
So um, just to give you a, a few uh, information about um, morphology, morphology, the term Goethe defined is, is it, field of form research, right? But it's also, it's not only nested in biology, but also there's something called architectural morphology that has been developed in 20th century. And uh, the, the person that coined that term is actually Philip Stedman, who wrote uh, on archetypes, building archetypes. And uh, there has been a lot of research on uh, various historical works, various types, like somebody uh, like Rudolf Wittkower wrote, the Palladian grammar, uh, where they try to understand the variation in Palladian villas as a subdivision, a subdivision algorithm. And Lionel March also looked at uh, graph-based uh, architectural plans, right? So there's a geometric investigation of architecture, but how does it work with symmetry? How does it tie to the biological notion of morphology that's, that is a bit underdeveloped? And that's where this type of research can come in. And my interest is specifically in historical works is because those are the, the architectural bodies that express symmetry. They, they work with symmetry and they work with a notion of growth. So um, these were the four types that I investigated in my dissertation, uh, but I also, of course, like expanded it um, to a lot, a lot of diverse body types as well. Um, and today I'm going to show you a few Gothic cathedrals as well, but we're also going to look at prison plans, for instance, that are more vegetal-like. Um, now, just to give you kind of an intermission, um, like I'm not only doing research, of course, I'm also teaching architecture, especially where I am at the moment. And um, the way we, I approach to design teaching in the sense, like because I'm investigating all of historical topics on symmetry, um, that also being influenced a lot with uh, a kind of a, an in investigation on ornamentation, because ornamentation is also a, a valuable architectural component that has been forgotten in 20th century. I think Adolf Loos's ornament, uh, ornament and crime text was a, was a mis big misled, uh, mislead on the, on the way ornaments should be understood in architecture. And um, the, this is the, the, I'm going to show you some examples of my teaching at Kadir Haas in Istanbul, but uh, I did a lot of teaching when I was at Georgia Tech as well. So these tools, when they are mixed with technology, they can actually produce a lot of aesthetic variation that could be used in architectural education as well. And this is what I call as reverse pedagogy. Basically, in a conventional design studio, you would start with a site and program. You will give uh, the students the site and you're, you will say like you're designing a school or you're designing an office or whatnot. And they will actually start developing some conceptual uh, analysis of the site and then they will come up with some uh, strategies uh, but of course, this is a one way of approaching design. And I think that's that's pro highly problematic because um, it actually restricts creativity to the capacity of individual students. And I don't think design education should be talent-based because design, I don't think is tied to talent. Um, if we can de develop the right technological tools, the right pedagogical tools, I think everybody could understand from design and everybody can actually design pretty things as well because there are a lot of techniques that we can use. And that's when I, I think this type of analytical research prior to any type of building implementation or building design is crucial because we can start with what I call as figure configuration studies where students actually work with abstract elements and they define networks, structural networks, tile networks or surface networks. And then they apply it towards a given design case. So in a sense, they are developing a machine that could be applied into a building typology or site, right? So in that sense, their tools are restrictive. So they, they cannot do everything. They can only work with the tools that they design. So I'll just show you an example of this. Like th this is the research um, that I carried in when I was at Georgia Tech, when I was teaching there. And these students looked at Louis Sullivan's ornamentation and they did these phenomenal paper models where they investigated the notion of curvature. They developed all of, uh, these symmetrical diagrams, aesthetic fringes that I call, and a lot of technical analysis of how curves work as well. Because if you don't know how to draw a curve properly in Rhino, then you cannot actually make something pretty, I think. So the, the curvature on these geometries have to be precisely built. And then they develop these uh, fringes that I call as like facade components. And all of them have different thicknesses. They have different structural purposes. And when they're brought together, they make these sorts of uh, nice uh, screens. And by replicating this a few times, they actually arrive at these laser cut models, right? So in a sense, that type of 
aesthetic notion of um, modeling uh, figuration that can also be tied to some interpretation of materiality. So we can use laser cutters, we can use 3D printing to maybe build models that also stand up. So in a sense, we are using these as paper models, of course, but why not build these in steel or concrete or some other material that could be cut as well, right? So that in that sense, I think that can have some impact on the way we teach design as well, because I don't think um, we have to mimic the kind of problems that have emerged in 20th century. We can actually develop new digital tools and tackle maybe aesthetics as well in that sense. And in Kader House, like I actually did um, a sec another version of this type of teaching that, that I call as Ornament is Prime. Omar is going to present you uh, his work in that studio today, but uh, basically, in this studio, we actually looked at a lot of historical types of ornamentation and students tried to develop similar diagrammatic analysis of them. And then they did uh, some material models, material replication. So they were trying to bring together these sorts of models and they were designing um, an apartment block in Istanbul, in a central part of Istanbul, but they, they had different types of programs as well. So in a sense, program and site was secondary to the way these systems were built, right? So because our primary goal is to build these structural aesthetic systems, and then we can actually define what type of program could fit inside of this structure. What, where, how can we actually manipulate this system inside of a site? So the constraints can come afterwards, because I think the system has to be generative and restrictive in the, in the beginning, and then it can be varied to accommodate different types of architectural solutions. And that's, I think, where it can get really interesting. And this was one of those um, variations. Uh, these, these group of students, if you look at on the left, you, they looked at uh, Alphonse Mucha's uh, cards and they looked at the, the hair uh, on those cards, the hair of the, um, the women hair in those cards. And they tried to understand how these bundles of curves actually came together. So they tried to make these sorts of structural columns that are bending, right? So in a, in a sense, you can take this as, um, as kind of a maximized notion of Art Nouveau as an ornament, because now we have these sorts of uh, networking columns, but then how do they come together? How can we fit them inside a building structure? And that's when they actually started making uh, 3D models. And you can, you can imagine yourself like moving in a space where these like bundling curves are like behaving like columns or beams, right? But uh, the notion of column and beam, that's that's completely dissolved in this case because they're all they all transmit to each other. So um, it was really interesting to see this type of work being done in Turkey as well. Like I, so that that already sets the argument saying that this is actually devoid of your your geographic location or the level skill level of students, right? You can actually if you can if you build the right tools, I think this could be taught anywhere. Um, so now let's get to. Um, a few extensions on research. I, uh, early on, I described three terms. Morphogenesis um, um, was basically um, about how we grow these uh, formal, uh, formal tools, right? So the leaf morphogenesis examples that I shown you, I introduced you to the concept of metamorphosis that we found in Goethe. And um, we also talked about morphology as a unified field of science that is applicable to biology, natural sciences, but also architecture, right? So what, how can we do research at the intersection of these? So I'm going to show you some examples. Um, I actually have three examples to show you of, the, of my recent research. Um, but the, the term that I described to you, digital romanticism, is what I call as a technical philosophy of form, right? So then that could have... Um, basic explorations on organic forms, natural forms like leaves, animals. It can also have architectural morphogenesis. So how can we actually grow buildings like organisms, for instance? That's, that's I think, where morphology could be really interesting because then we can explore this animal and vegetal qualities in buildings as well. And I'm going to discuss three projects with you together uh, today. Um, homeomorphic architecture, parametric mucarnas, and morphogenetic vaults. Um, these are basically, some of them are ongoing projects, but some of them have been completed. So I'll show you some examples of kind of the research output. Um, now, exploring homeomorphism, I, I don't know if most of you have seen this movie, but um, this is one of my favorite movies of, um, directed by Gustav Sand. Uh, called called Goodwill Hunting, and in the movie, Goodwill Hunting actually solves this mathematical problem of uh, homeomorphically irreducible trees on the 
corridor in MIT, and they're only um, uh, they're only restrictive types. So uh, the problem is basically about a node network, a limited node network, and um, the problem is given as hom uh, plot the homeomorphically reducible trees of ten nodes, right? So uh, we have a restriction on the amount of nodes that we can generate and we have to develop some sort of networking structure and mathematically this is actually um there are only 10 possibilities i'll get to that slide in a bit but uh, let's understand what homeomorphism is first and then i will also discuss why i'm talking about homeomorphism as a mathematical concept now um, there are actually three properties to it homeomorphism is isomorphic meaning any type of topological variation like stretching of points rotation of points is um, not important because what we care about is the connectivity, right? So here in the regular case, you can see, for instance, we have um, six nodes that are connected in this fashion and the white nodes are what we call as inner nodes, black nodes are the external nodes. So this would be a homeomorphically irreducible tree of uh, n equals six, basically, right? Because there is a total of six nodes. So, and the, the left and the right, they're identical because here you can, rotate it, you can uh, topologically distort it, it actually doesn't change anything about it. Um, but one other property, uh, two other properties of homeomorphism exist, which are cycles are forbidden. So we cannot have node networks that connect onto themselves. So we cannot have cycles like this, or we cannot have trees that are irreducible. So you cannot have an inner node with only two connections because we can take this inner node out. So that kind of sets a mathematical uh, description of uh, homeomorphic trees. So for instance, for 10 nodes, this was the problem Goodwill Hunting solved. We get um, these 10 possibilities, right? And uh, what I realized is if you actually look at the, the se sequence of connectivity to the inner nodes, you can actually reduce um, some of these trees to a sequence of numbers, which is almost like a genetic code, right? So if you look at here, the inner node has only nine connections. So um, we can just define it as nine, number nine. So number nine is actually this type. Whereas if you have five, five, five comma five means two inner nodes with five connections and that's how they connect actually. So four, six looks like this, three, three, three looks like this, three, seven looks like this. So um, when I actually saw this image, I immediately started thinking like, actually some of these look like, remind me of historical building plans. And uh, some of them actually look like cathedrals, some of them look like uh, office buildings, some of them look like airports, right? So in a sense, homeomorphic trees kind of reveal some uh, plant-based notion almost about architectural plants. So we, what if like we can actually look at this as a mathematical formula for generating architectural plants? And then I actually saw images like this. For instance, this is um, Eastern State Penitentiary built in 1836. And on the left, you're seeing kind of a tree structure with eight nodes. Right, so this is um, what we call is number seven because a single node is interior and then we have eight nodes. And over time, this prison actually grew outward. So this is almost like a physical manifestation of architectural growth, right? And the way it happened is almost like a vegetal structure. So we added more branches, we um, like bifurcated from corridors, we added more limbs. So this is what I would call as limb texture. Basically, it's an architecture of limbs. There is no torso. It's just like we are adding wings to a mathematical network of structure. And why am I talking about prisons? Because prisons are actually, I think, like the most mathematically optimized structures. So you need an inner connectivity of node network where the guards can actually travel. So they actually monitor the inmates. And that's where you actually get a lot of this type of formal complexity emerging, especially when you look at other prisons as well. So here you can see that when we actually start looking at variation in this way, architectural variation, morphological variation, you can see that we're almost looking at different types of insects, right? We have uh, prisons with like five wings, prisons with explants, prisons like Eastern State Penitentiary that is like proliferous, and uh, plus plants, uh, also the panopticon. Basically, it's a limbless torso. We have like a rotunda that is rounded and closed within itself. So in a sense, there's a, almost like a mathematical uh, description of these types and it's highly proliferous, right? It's highly variational. And the way I approach this problem is um, I think twofold. The first one is like, then how do we compute homeomorphism algorithmically, first of all, like how does this work? And then the second of all, 
after we compute it, what can we do with it, right? So we can actually now speculate on maybe some architectural plans, as well as maybe we can come up with um, like other types of simplified notational basis of architectural plans as well, which, which could be interesting. So my understanding or implementation for homeomorphism was in this way. So if we have, let's say, a sequence of numbers, in this case, three, four, six, we can actually propagate this in a growth fashion, starting from a single inner node, and then we can add growing uh, nodes in a linear basis. And we can arrive at this body um, that you see on the right. And then the first thing we can do is, uh, because we have the node connectivity, we can offset the nodes into a topological form. And then we can self-segment it to define circulation and rooms as well, right? So the, in a sense, I'm looking at uh, kind of a mapping of a basic plan structure with inner corridors. And this almost looks like an anatomical representation of it as well. So imagine the homeomorphic tree as kind of a skeleton of it. And then we are just offsetting it topologically to define spaces. Uh, so in, in that sense, like I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the simplest a way of understanding architectural plans. And what's interesting about that is you can actually plot a lot of variation with it. So, so you can, um, here you're looking at homeomorphically reducible trees of um, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 nodes, right? So I can generate them as plants now because I have the algorithm. So all I have to do is feed in these three sequence of parameters and I'll get this shape. And I can then topologically um, manipulate it as well. Um, but I actually went a bit more uh, further. So I, I said like, well, we can actually generate it as a linear code. We can have a sequence of uh, like an axis, but we can also have pattern code. Like what if we had a special coefficient, like a star at one of these numbers, and then we can actually have pattern distribution, right? All the subsequent segments can actually grow in a similar pattern. And you can see here, for instance, the left one, we have a, a hit code of 64443. So if you look at here, this base, we have six connections here. Then uh, four, four, four is basically a plus. <clears throat> and then the end is three. And on the right, we are looking at a different uh, pattern, four star, four, four star, four, which is basically the, the first four stars in the middle. And you create four branches that branch fourfold. And then you get another four star that branches fourfold as well. So in that sense, uh, we can have a lot more control about um, symmetry implementation in these. And when you build these as code, now they're totally variational, right? So you can change the, the parameters of the linear code. You can change the distancing between the inner segments. You can control which uh, number in the sequence you want to be patterned. And um, basically, you're looking at a parameter space like this. That's all you need. Uh, so in a sense, like this is maybe the DNA code of these plants. Like I'm, I'm thinking like uh, if I have an animal like this, that's its DNA code in plant, right? Because I'm capturing its skeletal structure. I'm also capturing its topological variations as well. I think topological variations here are secondary because what we are interested in organization, I think architecture is organization. So in a sense, we can create a lot of variation with this engine. And I, I did produce a lot of uh, variations. Of course, some of these don't look like existing buildings, but some of them do. Like some of them look like cathedrals. Some of them look like, for instance, I got um, Le Corbusier's towers here. Uh, you can create a lot of like uh, vegetal structures, hospitals, modern buildings, these sorts of like plus signs. So again, in that sense, like if you remember the earlier slide of the insects, we can actually start looking at architecture in a field of variation like this, right? And all of these are generated with the same code, just like um, nature generates animals or plants, right? So it basically offers kind of a genetic investigation of architectural variation. Now, Taking this a step further, um, I actually have uh, two more projects to show you. This is my research on Gothic anatomy. So um, we're going to look at the same way we looked at those homeomorphic plans, prisons, but we are going to expand it towards uh, religious structures like uh, Gothic bodies. Uh, and I, the way I, I approach this is um, what I call as um, like an anatomy lesson. So just think about like in 16th, 17th century, you're actually working with a cadaver, right? A dead body. And you're trying to understand it, its parts. And if we have 
um, Gothic cathedrals, then how do we actually divide it into parts, which, which is basically an interesting question. So uh, Gothic bodies are um, not anatomically, um, I, I would say, similar to other structures, but there are, of course, like some morphological principles that they probably share with other architectural works, right? So where do we, where do we actually begin to draw a line between parts and holes? That's, that's kind of where my investigation started. And just to give you kind of a snapshot, I'm not actually alone doing this type of research. There are a lot of architects, theoreticians who are also doing similar computational investigation of historical works, because I think um, the way we approach digital technology doesn't have to be limited to 20th century notion of computation, right? We can actually look at historical works and reveal a lot of mathematical aesthetic principles there as well that maybe we can revitalize in our age. And in that sense, I, I tried to give you kind of a snapshot of other examples that um, you, you see on the slide as well. Now, if we get back to Gothic, um, I, I would say that Gothic um, bodies, there, there are a lot of different types as well. Like there are, there are different tendencies in Gothic bodies. And you can actually almost make polarity comparison between French and English Gothic. Um, but the way I look at them is kind of a distribution of uh, torsos and limbs. So if you look at, for instance, on the left, if to Bourges Cathedral, you're looking at a, a torso, a, a body without any wings, right? There are no transepts here. There is only a single nave and that is bounded by narthex and the apse. Whereas in Salisbury, being the most proliferous um, cathedral in England, we get double transepts, right? So that we, we not only get... Uh, like a cross plan, we actually get a double cross plan. So it, it shows that the limbs overtake over the torso, right? And here you can actually see it a bit more clearly. So if you actually segment it in these parts, the apse, the nave, uh, and the narthex, you almost get a mimicked uh, tripartite structure that I shown with the animals. So in a sense, architecture mimics the, the way animal bodies are organized, which is, I think, very interesting, uh, theoretically. But um, here, like, you can also see how they vary among different cathedrals as well. Like, Nartex here is more contractive. In um, Bourges, it's more expensive. And here, the nave is expensive. On Salisbury, they are contractive. So you can see, like, expanded and contracted variations and the balancing of different parts on these um, Gothic plants. And I started actually computing these uh, as well. So you can here see like some computational investigation um, of these uh, Gothic bodies. So if you're looking at the torso, we are actually self-segmenting it into, uh, into naves um, and aisles as well. Whereas if you have like um, output of uh, wings, then we can actually like self-segment it and coordinate it with the torsos as well. And this is like um, where my research is kind of heading at the moment. And um, we can also start plotting out of uh, topological variations. Of course, these cathedrals do not exist, but there is no need for them not to exist digitally, right? Because I don't think we're going to build any Gothic cathedrals now, but we cannot expand on the idea of morphogenetic uh, principles behind Gothic, because now we can actually start making some relationship of how Gothic bodies are organized and how other structures are organized as well. So in a sense, my argument is not Gothic, not prison architecture, not homeomorphic, right? So I'm, I'm trying to generate a whole pool of variation of architectural forms that are devoid of any style. So I think we can look at any type of, any century, any type of building, and maybe start understanding how architectural morphology operates. What are the general rules of architecture? How do we organize buildings? That's kind of the question. So in a sense, what makes it Gothic? What makes it Renaissance? What makes it a Baroque? What makes it modern? I think that question is secondary. And uh, that also times, ties it to maybe other notions of ecology, technology, style. And I think those are secondary because this morphological perspective is, I think, more the intrinsic notion of architectural rules, right? I'm, I'm interested in understanding what those interesting rules are. Um, now I'm going to show you two more projects. Uh, one of them is called Morphogenetic Vaults, which is a more in detailed computation investigation of uh, Gothic ribs. So here you're looking at a lot of uh, interesting variations of the Gothic vaults. And you, you can see that the ribs actually define these sorts of force lines that um, kind of connect these structures 
with each other, right? And you can get a lot of uh, different types of networks, like limb-like networks, netted networks, radial networks as well. Um, but my take on that was about investigating symmetry through the notion of polarity. Like, can we actually make a vegetal structure that grows two-dimensionally, and then we can investigate maybe a form-finding technique uh, of a vault vaulting structure. So in this case, um, this is actually a still ongoing project. I'm planning to actually build um, some of these structures that you're going to see in a bit this semester with students at Kadir House University. We, we now have a digital fabrication lab. Now we can actually build physical uh, pavilions. Um, but here you can see, um, like these are these were some of the asymmetrical outputs of this type of engine. So I'm looking at almost like, uh, looking at these like, uh, algaes, right? So like more vegetal, two-dimensional plant-like structures. But then I actually found out about this jellyfish called Ephira. And what's fascinating about Ephira is um, this is actually like an eight-limbed um, limbed, uh, jellyfish. But if you cut one of its wings, uh, one of his limbs, then what, what happens is the jellyfish actually self-organizes itself and tries to close that gap. Now, why does the animal do that? It's because it's trying to actually find the equilibrium, right? Even if you create an asymmetry by removing these branches, the animal needs to find equilibrium in order to move. So in a sense, locomotion requires symmetry, like anatomical symmetry. But that doesn't mean a symmetrical body because seven is not a symmetrical number, so to speak. But if they're radially organized, then it could be balanced. Um, but my investigation was like, can we actually take symmetrical plants and look at vaulting structures, like what kind of hierarchical vaulting structures can we actually get? Now, these are of course not mimicking glottic grips per se, but I'm actually getting this inner skeleton mapped onto a surfacing structure. So I'm trying to find what kind of a, a vaulting structure we can actually get with symmetrical plants as well as asymmetrical plants. Because here I'm using gravitational simulation in kangaroo Probably you have uh, heard about this tool, but basically we can actually implement it in such a way that the end structure has balance or equilibrium, right? Just because you have asymmetry in plan doesn't mean you don't you, don't, you cannot have balance or symmetry in gravity. So um, that all actually like is the interesting part because I'm I'm not interested in building symmetrical structures. There could be local symmetries but there could be asymmetries that are balanced as well. And I think a lot of architecture does that automatically. And these were some of the computational investigations. You can see that the engine can output a lot of variations. So I'm planning to investigate this a bit more with students. And you can see like it can output all the variations and we can actually start seeing maybe different material interpretations or properties to this. And um, that's, uh, with that, I'm going to move on to my last um, project, which I call as Paramatic Mukarnas. This is a recent project that we finished in Turkey and we looked at um, 16 different structures containing 22 Mukarnas, Mukarnas uh, gates in uh, Sivas and Kayseri, two cities that were, um, that were the main hubs during the Seljukit area uh, in, in Anatolia. And I'm going to share with you some of the computational uh, things that we learned from this project. And this was kind of the overall structure of this project. We first developed a photo scanning technique where we extracted models. So I call this almost like extracting specimen from nature, right? So you go and you collect a leaf or, or an insect. Uh, it's basically kind of taxonomical work. So you, you the way we do it architecturally is by uh, photogrammetry, we actually map it. And then we process the data, we try to clean it up so that we we are working with clean rhino models, and then we understand its structure through analysis, and then we try to generate parametric codes. And um, these are some of the structures that we did the photo scanning. Here you can see, like we get actually pristine 3D models where we can extract all the information, a lot of detailing. And something that is interesting about working with heritage works is there's a lot of um, damage to these works. Like they, there's erosion, for instance, because it's made out of stone, uh, especially the Mukarnas in Anatolia, they are made out of stone. So um, we try to outline the principles, the rules, so that we can actually maybe use this data for future reconstruction or for um, you know other type of restoration work, which is, I think, really important. So all these heritage works, they need to be mapped actually. 
Uh, but our research uh, was actually uh, looking at the notion of symmetry. And uh, my hypothesis was that the mucarnus is actually growing from the tip downward. So it's actually a cascading structure, but it's actually growing uh, like a pyramid, uh, right? And uh, we kind of tried to prove it with this uh, recursive algorithm. And here you can see we have these sorts of hierarchical branching, symmetrical branching emerging and we investigate these sorts of plants. And all this material is um, published, by the way, um, um, but I'm, I'll show you some material that is not published yet, but it's, it will be published eventually. And uh, we tried to do some algorithmic implementation here. You're looking at um, the Kayseri, the analysis of Kayseri Hajipulish Mosque, but here you, you can see this. There's tons of uh, proportional reading of this plan, but what's fascinating is that um, there are actually replicating rules, geometries that are mimicking each other, right? So we, when we try to map these sorts of proportions, we actually found pattern inside of this structure, which basically means it grows like a fractal, right? So it kind of proof of concept. So if you look at it from top and there are mimicking structural patterns of this emergence, then it's, if it basically, if it mimics fractals, then it's like a tree. It's, um, it's growing downwards, but we are building it in the reverse fashion, which is a paradox in itself, right? So how are we building something um, bottom up that grows top down? That's a question, basically. Um, but anyway, here um, you're looking at our system that uh, we called it as M system, as Mukarna system. And these are the proportions that we extracted. So there are three different axes of growth. Here you can see the blue axis is the diagonal growth. That's also a symmetry axis, by the way. And then we have orthogonal branches that are marked in red. And then the secondary branches that are marked in uh, green or cyan. And these proportions are actually used in all these um, layer generation and they're actually patterned. So here in Haji Kulich, most of the pattern is like this. So on blue axis, you get BC, on cyan axis, you get AAD, and on orthogonal axis, you get BCB. And all these rules actually replicate each other. And we try to explain it here through the plan analysis, like these pieces do replicate each other if you, if you look at it closely. And when you build it as an algorithm, um, we are actually growing these structures in the tree 360 degrees, but you can see we can, we can actually grow a lot of layers. Like this is actually showing you the system in 10 layers, but this can grow infinitesimally because it's the fractal and it's a pyramid. It's a self-segmented pyramid, basically. Um, but this is my last slide. What's uh, interesting about this is when you change the parameters, you can actually grow a lot of uh, different types that we don't find in Anatolia. So that's in a way extracting the genetic code by looking at these sorts of variations and then exploring the uh, genetic potential. So by changing um, kind of the um, orthogonal, diagonal, and secondary axis patterns, you can actually generate all of self-replicating pattern structures that are fractal-like. And I'm wondering if um, this also has some, um, some interesting um, um, statement about for instance, Islamic architecture, because we had um, a symposium called um, Resilience in Digital Heritage uh, last year, and uh, I was discussing the architecture of Sinan. And in a way, like some of these Mukarna structures remind me of Sinan's mosques. So the, the way the, the Mukarna structures are built in a negative way, they actually look like the external morphology of, uh, for instance, the Blue Mosque or the, uh, you know, Suleimaniye. So in a sense, um, this type of uh, gravity distribution, this pyramidal structure that's kind of um, being replicated, uh, and we found examples of it uh, through algorithmic analysis in uh, Seljuk architecture, which was, I think, really interesting. Anyway, um, that's where I would stop. I, I'm, I hope it, it was interesting for you. I, um, I'm sorry if the material was too extensive. I like sharing this type of material so that there could be different types of engagements, and I'm looking forward to your questions. So thank you, thank you for listening. The platform is all yours. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Saraha Arkinet uh, for the invitations. And uh, it's also an honor to, to present my research uh, with, uh, with the platform. And it's an honor to share the, the talk with uh, my instructor and my professor, Sabri Gokman. 
this research was back in 2019. Um, it was a research studio called Ornament is Prime. It was a research by me and uh, Arsh, uh, architect uh, Arwa Al Hadi from Libya. It was supervision by Dr. Sobrikov. So Ornament is Prime. It, uh, it's uh, we we picked the great tiles. Before we before I start that research, I didn't know anything about great tiles, but. Uh, as an uh, expert, they know it as an uh, uh, architecture, uh, Islamic architecture. So, look full screen. Yes. So, what is great tiles? Great tiles is an architecture and handicraft object that are used uh, uh, as an Islamic decorative patterns applied to many buildings, like uh, building elements such as domes, walls, window, and screens. Uh, and you can see it like uh, in many different. Uh, uh, window and uh, uh, domes in uh, in top cabisare in Roman uh, music uh, museums and also in uh, many different uh, uh, music uh, mosque in uh, in uh, Iraq in Turkey uh, and also first uh, uh, pattern or a great tile has been used it was in uh, in Syria back in one thousand. Uh, in Baghdad, sorry, found it uh, in in a Quran book in front of a uh, Quran book. Great, how it's great uh, works is consisting of angled lines that form and interlace to strip board pattern. Uh, also, we come back. When does it start? Great decoration is believed that have been inspired by Syrian Roman uh, from the second century, and the earliest great pattern ever was seen uh, on the Quran book found in Baghdad uh, from the year 1000. Unfortunately, we couldn't find uh, any picture or photo of that uh, Quran book. So, uh, also, uh, how many types great tiles have? Uh, the great orientation was progressed during the time, but it's progress that does not allow the previous version to disappear. So this compass and straight edge, great tiles and two level designs. We will see later on. And also this is an example of how uh, uh, has that great tile applied in the wall, in the domes, with the different geometric and angle and degrees, and also in the window. Um, the two type that has uh, uh, great uh, great tiles, uh, like the combos and straight, that uh, that is the let's say the 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 normal way or the organic way that they use uh, has been used to, to create uh, great tiles. That is the type of consisting of inter intersecting inter circles that create a guideline allowed from polygon grid that can used alone in the uh, on the has angled lines from the interlaced inter strip pattern. Uh, what is the type of gray tile? They created by three or four tiles like Dagons and Bowtie and Poppin. Uh, before we go into also gray tiles that uh, it shows um, the creation, like when you create gray tiles, you can have five, uh, as we just said, the Dagon, the, uh, the Bowtie, the Poppin, uh, and uh, pentagons, uh, but when we when we start our research was um, like this is a great tile like historical way, but in our research we wanted to push boundaries throughout uh, the history that we always find great tiles as a two D or two D point five. Um, we wanted to push boundaries a little bit in our research. And we wanted to create a facade by uh, that wrap it up with angles it's holding from different uh, uh, angles without losing the features of the pop and bow tie and uh, the dagons because these features has the angles. When you folding them, you lose their, their its features. So that was the challenging when we did our research. The project was to, to create a facade or folding that that covered the building uh, without losing these features of that type. So these the 2D arrangement you, we study and we found it in many different buildings, the tile arrangement, the cutting extra, applying on surface. We, we start studying every shapes and how has been created because uh, 
in, uh, in, in, the, in the progress of, of creating that arrangement, uh, some, some, some project that they don't use all the type of uh, gray tiles, like the Digon, the Botai, the Poppin, some they use it, some not. So we started researching about uh, uh, these kind of, uh, of the project and we applied the tiles on them with the pattern and to understand how it has been created. So later on, we start doing our own arrangement. So we create with the wood, uh, these three types of uh, the, like the poppin and the bow tie, and we start creating them. So the bow tie, the, the gray ties, uh, it has a, uh, a line, the pattern that by these pattern, you uh, by these lines, you create the pattern itself. So we have a tile and we have a pattern. So when we start arranging different tiles and we did have many different uh, study and as chose like here in the, in the left, we start using poppin and bow tie and we creating this shape and by this arrangement, then we use only bow tie tiles and we start doing an overlapping to create the, to see the pattern of that uh, arrangement. Then we start using poppin and bow tie with different shapes and we cutting them and uh, uh, overlapping the diagram itself. So we start going through every different shape to understand how we can create and also trying to find a symmetrical way that when we folding them, we don't lose the features uh, by, uh, by the, let's say the, the features of that tiles. So then we start using it like Bushing a little bit uh, uh, from 2D to creating a 3D, like um, trying to folding them without also uh, see how, where we can reach with the edge, like to 45, to 50, to 60, like trying to, to, to see where we can go. And then we, we, in our way, we start using it like as a, um, the lines as a 2D, then we transfer them, them to physical model and we're experiencing them. Uh, and then we transfer them to a 3D model. So what, and this is like different type that we did throughout the research. Until now, we were not knowing where we're going. Like, because every time we go somewhere, we face a difficult that, uh, facing uh, uh, a problem that we may lose the features and we lose the tile itself. It doesn't make sense. Like the patterns would lose, the tiles will, like we cannot gonna see a great tiles in this shape or this uh, geometric uh, until we reach a point that we cannot do it uh, by only just 3D modeling. This is where we use uh, the algorithm. The algorithm that we use uh, in Rhino that we use a Grasshopper uh, plugin that we start coding and uh, uh, the algorithm uh, until we, and we, this is the algorithm that we use, this is only part of many algorithm that we use to, to create uh, the great tile shapes. So in this way, we reach in that arrangement of great tiles, the group of tiles that outline, then we transfer them to mesh formats, uh, then we color them uh, to reach to that 3D pattern. Here, when we reach that, we understand that okay, we are now in a in a in a good um, in a good place to 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 see where we're going, and also the folding are not losing itself. Uh, and it also um, when we go after that, we realize that we're only going to use these three: the argon, the bobbin, and the bow tie uh, to create this shape. Uh, like in every tile has form into different angle during the process of designing the massing to keep the continuity of the patterns. Until we reach to that, that shape, uh, which is, was the final proposal, like if you can see here in the, in the corner, that were the most challenging part. We want this pattern to be continuity of that shape without losing the, the, the gray tiles and the, the features of the great tiles and the pattern. And uh, we reach in that level. And it was like for us in that, in that level, it was a, a big uh, succeed like to reach that level because it was different uh, experiment to reach to that level. This is what the, also the, 
the last physical model that we have done and uh, uh, it shows here the how it's like uh, not losing the features of the gray tiles. Uh, and I, I'm keeping saying that because it was challenging because when you use it, like it, it, it has a like um, specific angles, specific uh, uh, features. Every time you're trying to folding in a many different way, uh, it broke, it, it loses its features. Uh, and that was like, like the best thing to, to work in something and you, you know what is the final result you want to reach uh, to, to cover a building as a folding, as a facade. Uh, and uh, as a 3D modeling to without losing that uh, features of the historical uh, ornament. Uh, and also in that shows the final picture that we have done. Um, and in the end, uh, still we're keeping uh, on that research, still we're not publishing the papers. This this was the part of the study we have done and we are keeping continue to do more on that research the paper will be published soon uh, we are working on on it and uh, still we're reaching in a different level of uh, of uh, of a result of that uh, research uh, i'm glad to be part of that if, of this talk uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, um, thank you very much uh, I think by this time we can move on to the question and uh, if you, Dr. Sabri and Omar, if you can join us again and we can, yes. thank you. So I have the uh, first question that I have heard and we are, uh, we can have your questions in the Q&A for the audience and uh, the first question was uh, for Dr. Uh, Sabri about uh, how impressive was the talk and uh, you, you tend to relate, uh, relate math to architecture and uh, on the level of form uh, generation. Most of the example you have shown presented the redu uh, presented reduced architecture into form and ethics with no uh, with, uh, with not showing the consideration of function and the users. So also uh, there are some uh, the 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 construct of all of the well uh, established theme of architecture as the styles and function. So uh, how do you uh, preserve to define architecture uh, to the approach your your approach? Um, so I guess the question was more about um. Like, what about program? I think that's the question, right? Because um, in a sense, I'm exploring the morphology from a purely technical, formal point of view. So we might be looking at prisons, offices, um, Gothic cathedrals, like any type of art building, basically. And we are exploring the geometry of it. And I tend to think that... Um, in order to fully explore certain types, for instance, Gothic plans, like they, they have certain rhythms, there are certain rule sets, right? But I think those rule sets are defined on those types. So if we have a technical tool that can bridge between other types as well, then we can also understand what is different for Gothic, what is different for a mosque, what is different for a hospital, what is different for an office building and vice versa, right? So in that sense, I'm more interested in developing the, the technical notion first prior to understanding other types of cultural, programmatic, functional aspects of architecture. I think that's kind of uh, my intention because uh, what, I, what I try to describe is, um, I called it as a technical philosophy of form. So the technical philosophy doesn't require function, doesn't require uh, program or culture as much right because we're exploring the geometry of the built environment so i'm trying to exclude them for now so that we can purely focus on the form of it because i think um the arguments could be mixed up a bit if we tend to think um like if we tend to bring something external to the to the notion of morphology i'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question but if there's a follow-up we can also discuss this a bit more Uh, your point, technormatism, uh, engaging with the comput computational perspective, or like um, 
for the heritage work. We saw examples in your research focusing on the Salgic and Gothic uh, architecture and certain mythological perspective ornamentation. Could you elaborate on how scripting and parametric tools guide us potential architectures to research in this uh, field? Um, oh, so that's the that's the question you posted. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I mean, so for me, uh, scripting and parametric tools, they shouldn't prescribe aesthetics, right? So parametric architecture doesn't need to be defined through parametric design tools because, because um, we have to keep in mind that prior to like Rhino, Grasshopper scripting, I don't know, we, there are other types of programs as well, but we were using uh, software that was developed in other industries, particularly like for uh, naval shipbuilding, right? So Katia um, in 90s, like when Gary was using it, um, they were actually borrowing NURBS modeling, which was used in uh, ships, ships and uh, planes. So the, basically they were developed by engineers. So they're not designed to be used for architects, right? And the way the, our digital notion of architecture started with tools that were designed by engineers for other types of production. And that's, I think, a problem because now we have a lot of people coming from architecture, coming from computation background that can design tools. So in a sense, we have to be selective about what kind of tools we want to use or what kind of geometries we want to output because parametric design tools are shouldn't be considered as a given, as a prescription of how architecture should be or how digital architecture should be. Um, I try to make that clear, but everything is digital, right? If, even if it's built in 13th century, if, if, if something has mathematics geometry, it's, it is digital. Just because we invented technology in 20th century doesn't mean uh, people didn't use geometry in 13th century when they were designing things. So in a sense, we have more advanced tools to compute them because we are working with computers, but that also shouldn't prescribe the aesthetics of it, right? In that sense, I think um, I, I tried to highlight the research on Mukarnas, on Gothic, on, you know, Arnevo, whatever era you want to pick, there are a lot of like things you can explore with um, generative algorithms and parametric design tools. So following up the question, uh, also there is um, this, as, the, as this is the method related to the technical side of morphology and, and its generative, how can you decide on the aesthetic of form, uh, which, uh, which one fits better than the other one with social body codes? Social beauty code, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a simple answer on that. Uh, <laughs> it's a difficult question. So, I mean, you're asking me how you compute aesthetics. Um, so in a sense, like, of course, we are looking at aesthetic systems, ornament being one, and we are trying to understand how aesthetics work, uh, because uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, the reason why I'm working in morphology is because I believe the way we, um, the way we appreciate beauty in buildings or architecture can only be possible if there are rules that are shared between the built environment and us, right? So there needs to be organic principles that are shared. Otherwise, how do we actually transmit? How do we perceive something? How do we find it beautiful? I mean, unless everything operates on symmetry. I think symmetry is a more central topic uh, here, like, um, because uh, I think growth and um, proportion that works with symmetry as well. And there are a lot of historical texts on it, mostly um, during the Renaissance, like Alberti being one, right? Alberti wrote the treatise on symmetry. Um, so in that sense, I think that's kind of the investigation. I, I don't think there's a formula necessarily. I don't think we can approach it from a social point of view. We can say like, this is better than that one, or this is more pretty than that one. I think everything in that sense has aesthetic value. Um, it's just maybe we can, we can have a more advanced notion of generating more aesthetic systems and maybe utilizing them in, uh, you know, public frontiers or buildings. Um, so that they actually output cultural aspects 
onto us as well because buildings can talk to us, right? I mean, a, a World UNESCO heritage site can only be ascribed if the building is aesthetic, if the building has aesthetic potential because its architect is dead. I mean, there's nobody to protect it on, other than the building itself. So it has to be so pretty that it needs to be protected. And that can only be done by aesthetics. So the reason why I showed you Divri Ulujami Mosque is because that build, I believe that building is highly pretty, highly aesthetic. And that's why it's on the World UNESCO Heritage Site. And it's really difficult to find the same in 20th century. So uh, also we can wrap up with the Amar uh, insight about one of the ideas that can be shared for the... Anybody in the audience wants to ask a question? I mean, there's no such thing as a bad question. Don't, you don't have to be intimidated. If, if you wanna ask anything, just go for it. Okay. Uh, okay, we have now. So from, from your point of view, uh, how do you see the future of, our, uh, of architecture uh, according to such an approach? Okay, I mean, I, th I think it's an exciting time, 21st century. Um, uh, especially like when architecture is being explored with computation, I think it's super exciting. And we're going to have more rigorous research being output um, rather than, you know, just focusing on design. Because I think if we, if we develop more intelligent, more advanced tools, then that, that can also help us design better things, design more, you know, integrated systems. Um, I mean, I'm, more interested in looking at historical works, understanding core principles of architecture, morphology, exploring notion of symmetry and growth, ornamentation, you know, like I, I kind of find value in those. And I think there'll be other contributions in the future as well. And it's, it's full of like potential stuff that we can look at. And that's why I think it's going to be really interesting. So like the stuff Omar showed, um, I mean, that, that, could, that could have been a project done in a master's or a PhD program, but he did it in an undergraduate design studio, you know? So it's, in a sense, like we can also um, transmit some of this knowledge to design education. And I think that there's going to be value in that too. So as I was saying, uh, uh, we have uh, reached to the end of our design talk for today. Uh, much appreciated uh, for your time. And we are uh, for sure looking forward to having, having you again in Arcanet. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I, I, I was really, um, it, was, it was really exciting to share with you the stuff I've been working on. And uh, it's also always nice to see Omar again. Uh, <laughs> I hope we can catch up sometime if you come by to Istanbul. Um, I'm, I also, like prior to this, we were talking about my interest in visiting uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Middle East. I'm really interested in seeing, um, exploring Middle East uh, as well. So hopefully we, we, we will get in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Everyone, thank, thank you all for attending and listening. Bye, guys.